Trying to move to this, so if I'm not speaking loud enough, let me know. Okay. I just was really happy when I got told that I could come down here and talk to you all. My name is Phil Wood. I'm a constituent from Columbia, Missouri. I teach at the University of Missouri. Coming down here, I noticed the weather's changing a little bit. It's that time of year in Missouri. You know, every time in the springtime, I look at the weather and I just kind of have to laugh a little bit at my family. My mother's from Germany, and every now and then about this year, we'd talk with the relatives in Germany about the tornado season we'd have. Of course, it being my family, they had ready advice. You Americans just don't build your buildings right. They're made out of wood. And that was a sore point of discussion for many years until one miraculous time a tornado happened in their little town in Germany. And when they saw the steel doors to the bank fly past them and go down the street, all of a sudden they didn't have quite so much advice. Tornadoes happen in Missouri. Bad things happen in Missouri. And it's just for the grace of God that your house has its peonies blooming by it and the next field to you of oats is flattened into the mud. I took a little time this morning to look at the Missouri State Vital Statistics. I saw in the year 2012 there were 76 late-term abortions in the state of Missouri. Now, imagine if a little town along the Missouri would get hit by a tornado, or say like, I think it was 1990 or so, Roachport had all that terrible flooding why our elected representatives would be down there to show solidarity with those poor people. I have a special place in my heart for those 76 families who had to make that rather difficult decision because mine is one of those families as well. <clears throat> Many people have a really convenient answer about abortion. They might say, well, you know, it really shouldn't be the woman's decision. Maybe we can make a law that will really cover everything so terribly well that the, there won't be any unnecessary suffering or people won't be making the wrong decisions. So here, in more or less simple language, is my story. I'm very lucky to have a young daughter. She's going to be a senior at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and after we had that daughter, we really wanted to have another kid. For reasons we couldn't quite explain, that second pregnancy just wasn't happening. So we explored fertility treatments. Those didn't work for a couple of years. And then finally, after changing physicians, we were, over, we were told maybe we could do a gift procedure to stimulate egg production, fertilize the eggs, and reimplant. And we were very happy to find out that it was positive, that preg the pregnancy took. Uh, that was good news. And then we waited a bit more, a few more tests. Everything was going fine. Then time came in for an AMU, uh, for an ultrasound. And we were told, oh, this is twins. Oh, well, you know, there's worse things than having twins. We're going to have this second you know, child that we very much wanted. Uh, I noticed at the time the doctor did not seem quite so happy about the twins as we did. They were twi placed very close to each other. Nonetheless, everything went along fine. Around the third month, we went in for amniocentesis and another ultrasound. And we were told, well, actually there's a problem. And the problem was this, that the two twins were so close to each other that they were sharing part of the placenta. So some of the blood from one twin was going out and not returning to it. It was going to the other twin. So one twin was smaller than he ought to have been, and the other one was quite large. So what to do? At about this time, fluid started to become imbalanced. Uh, my wife started to look like she was nine months pregnant all of a sudden. Uh, and 
the procedure for that was something called amnio drainage, where they will stick a needle into the belly and drain off some fluid. We tried that twice. It didn't seem to resolve the twin-twin transfusion problem that we had. Uh, then we started going back and saying, well, you know, maybe you need a really good ultrasound. Um, we waited a few weeks for that. Went to University Hospitals, had a really high-resolution ultrasound. Uh, and we're told that, well, because of the amnio drainage, there were bands now floating in the amniotic fluid. Maybe that would result in you know, digits being cut off or cleft palate or other things like that. We said, well, can you see any of that damage? No, no we can't. But we can tell you that the smaller twin is very small and probably won't survive. And it had underdeveloped, maybe not even kidneys. Well, what could be done? Shall you go forward with the pregnancy? Shall you not? Well, we decided to go forward. We really wanted to have those children. Uh, we looked at the available medical advice. And we're told that there was a procedure where you could tie off the umbilical cord of one twin so that the other one would live. And after looking uh, for that type of procedure, we settled on a doctor in Florida. Well, how best to get to Florida? Well, you're pregnant. Airlines will not fly you. And they will not fly a high-risk pregnancy. So we put my wife in the back of a van with a, on a bed, and I drove, and she laid on the bed all the way down to Florida. We got to Florida and were examined, and that night the doctor came in and said, well, the amniotic bands are so profound that you know, I cannot do anything for you. You need to go and have an abortion. And we were, of course, devastated. I said, well, where do we get an abortion? He said, I don't know. This is a Catholic hospital. We don't do that, and we don't give out that information. Go home, have an abortion. Uh, needless to say, that was pretty difficult. We were in touch with our physicians here in Missouri, and they said, well, uh, you can, there is an abortion clinic in St. Louis, and uh, Grand City. We stopped there, at which point they said, well, it's, you know, the head of the larger twin is too big, we can't do that. Uh, you'll have to continue home, which we then did. And we then waited to see what our next step would be. So after about the end of that week, we this is you know, a few years ago, my hair was not quite as white as it is now. We went to see to Wichita to see George Tiller. I don't need to tell you how difficult it is to go past an abortion clinic of protesters. I'm sure that you can imagine what those protesters say and do when a woman who looks like she's nine months pregnant starts walking through the door of the plane. It was very rude. It was very inconsiderate. It was very difficult. Um, Tiller's clinic was quite a surprise. First of all, you had to go through a metal detector to get into the clinic. And then after you went through the metal detector, the guard, you were in kind of a holding area. And covering the walls were framed statements from women and some families saying, thank you for your assistance. I was amazed at just seeing that visual display along with the words that the fellow would be seeing. The abortion itself took a few days. Uh, he verified the low heart rate and so forth of uh, the twins and he said that he could help us out. He was a little over the top. I mean, Dr. Tiller was a crusader. Uh, but he was also very compassionate. I was surprised that I got to be part of that abortion experience. Uh, I hope it's not telling any secrets out of school, but the 
during the abortion, he gave my wife quite a bit of bursary, so she doesn't really remember much of that experience. Uh, but you know, he did administer digoxin to stop the heartbeat of the twins, and then we came back for the delivery. Uh, it went smoothly. I was there present for it. I was able to hold the, the boys when they were born. Uh, it was very difficult. I was surprised after that when Tiller came to me and when my wife was in recovery and said, I'd like to hold a little baptism for your boys. Do you mind? And I said, no, that's fine. And he had a little bit of holy water and he baptized them, Lutheran, and he let me hold them for a bit. He had them in a nice little baby blanket. Uh, I got to say goodbye. And that was very important to me. Um, we drove back to Colombia. We tried to kind of put ourselves back together a bit. Uh, the doctor in Florida, by the way, after the boys were delivered, said he wanted to have the boys' bodies uh, so we could autopsy them for research. So he said anything that could possibly help someone else. And we did that. He didn't find anything that was structurally worthy of publication. A couple of weeks after that, uh, a rather thick packet came in the mail. And I thought, well, what is this? It's from Taylor's Clinic. And I opened it up, and there was a packet that said the words dignity, respect, and And I opened it up, and there he has taken pictures of all of that meant a lot to me. He was really someone who helped a family that had a tornado happen to him. Now, since then, of course, life has its small changes. We adopted a boy, as it turns out, from China. We just said we would like to adopt a child healthy. And we were very surprised when it was a boy from Heilongjiang province in northern China. He's quite the extrovert. He's quite the joy of my life. Everybody's rich as my daughter is. Uh, I am surprised, though, to say that uh, as he got ready to go to school, we found out that he was having some trouble seeing things. And it turns out that he has an inherited condition called retinitis pigmentosa, a pre-existing condition, if you will, and that he will eventually you know, become blind due to that condition. I'm very grateful to healthcare ethics to help our children who can not have to worry about getting insurance to work the existing condition. I have another story to tell you too about tornadoes. My older sister was a registered nurse. And I have to admit, I'm a professor. I kind of like to live in a nice, tidy world too. We were in a restaurant in Iowa, and a lady sitting next to us, all of a sudden, kind of stiffened up and slumped down to the floor. And my sister said, here, give me the steak knife. And I did. She said, go find a ballpoint pen. And she did. Well, long story short, this was a woman who had some kind of anaphylactic shock. And my sister had used the steak knife to open her throat. And then use the ballpoint pen to provide an airway for it. After all the excitement had died down, I said to her, now, you're just a nurse. That would have been something I would have expected a doctor to do. She said, the nearest doctor is 18 miles away. As a healthcare professional, I'm bound to do what I need to do. My older sister was someone I was very proud of. She was the first person to go to college. 
unfortunately, oh, she's about now three years ago, she lost her job as a nurse. That also means she lost her health care. Unfortunately, during this time, she also developed diabetes. Well, trying to help out, I paid for her COBRA, because where are you going to get money to pay for these types of things when you're, you've been let go? It was very difficult. I also know, I'm fairly sure, that she wasn't taking all the insulin that she needed to be taking so that she could make it go for it. So I was not entirely surprised two years ago when I received a phone call from the husband saying that my sister had suffered a massive heart attack and died. She left behind her two boys. Uh, she had just taken the youngest one off to college to start college at the week before. I wish that Medicaid could have been there for my sister. I wish that she could have had the medicine that she needed to have the life that she could have enjoyed watching her two boys grow up into the fine young men they may be. As you might be able to tell, I don't often think about hurricanes. <clears throat> that is, until one comes through. I'm really very grateful to all the people who are here today. You're the ones who show up. You're the ones who care. Even though it doesn't affect you personally. I wish I had your sensibilities. I come to the party late. I went on to a website that would allow me to do electronic petitions. And I thought, this Medicaid expansion thing, my sister's terrible, sad story, I should do something. I don't know what to do, though I'm not really a political person, so I put up a petition to say that Missouri should expand its Medicaid. I'm not exactly socially networked, but I was surprised when 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people signed, representatives have signed. And the wonderful thing about that petition is it also had a spot for you to put on a few messages, a few notes, individual notes. I became aware of so many tornadoes in Missourians lives. A woman who said, my mom needs care. Someone has to stay home and, st and stay with her. I can't do my job anymore. We don't qualify for Medicaid. What am I going to do? Why are they not expanding Medicaid? A soldier who came back from service to the country said, all of a sudden, I can't work anymore. I can't concentrate. I don't know what's going on, but I can't work on my job. Is this the way that Missouri wants to treat its veterans? It's not the abject poor that we're talking about. We're talking about people who are working enough that they are just over the poverty line. It would seem to me that these are exactly the kind of Missourians that we would want to get back to. I wonder why I have not heard anything from the President of the Senate, why I have heard nothing from my representative, about 5,000 signatures delivered to your office. If 5,000 people tell you that this is something you should do, the very least that that deserves is some kind of a response, some kind of answer, some kind of a statement of a justification 76 women in 2012 sought late-term abortions. People will die as a result of the failure to expand Medicaid. They die not through any fault of their own. 
they pass on because we do not, as a society, provide for them the way that we ought. This concludes my remarks. May I inquire of a future uh, fellow Missourian? Yes. Hi, I'm Deb Lavender. Nice to see you. Hi, I'm Deb Lavender. I'm here from Kirkland, Missouri. I'm here to participate in the filibuster for women in Missouri. So many times in our history, I don't think we are well represented. I have a book I'm going to read for, from today called Called to Courage, Women in Missouri History from Margaret Ford 